lament of the enemy that will try to steal the word from gaining lodgment inside of our hearts. But it is going to be planted on good ground, and it is going to produce so much fruit for the kingdom of God. And so we give you praise, glory, and adoration for it. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. I want you to look at your neighbor this morning and say, neighbor, there's a rhema word in the house for you today. Please don't interrupt me. Hey, man, sometimes some may not know what a rhema word is. A rhema word is a now word from God, you know, and when we look in Scripture, that's called the logos or the law, the thoughts of God, uh, and that those are written, but the rhema word is a now word that God speaks to your heart and my heart as an individual. And so uh, we're excited because we're continuing the series of teaching entitled Drifting. I have run into so many people in, in different places and online and people that I've met in stores that I don't even know and say, they'll stop me in the aisle and say, Pastor, I'm watching that Drifting series, and it has been ministering to me. And I pray that those who have been really paying attention and journeying along, that it's ministering life to you as well. We found this script, this series of teaching began by way of definition in Hosea chapter 4, verse number 7 is our foundation reference of scripture. So let's throw that up real quick. Hosea chapter 4, verse number 7 says this. It says, the more they increase, the more they sinned against me. I will change their glory into shame. The more they increase, the more they sin. That's almost a contradiction because you would think that the more you increase, the more thankful you would be. You would think that the more that God does in your life, the more gratitude you would actually have. You would think that the more prayers that actually get answered, that it would be called serve even more, that it would cause me to give even more. But what I've discovered is that the, pro the, pro the proclivity of man's heart many times doesn't lead him to press more into God once his or her desires are fulfilled. We see this throughout Scripture that so many it, it had an issue with drifting. After events happen in their life, after Elijah experienced one of the greatest miracles that I think the earth has ever seen, he still drifted. David drifted in his legacy as king. I mean, you go throughout Scripture, Saul drifted, Solomon drifted, so many drifted. And you and I as believers, we have to be cognizant of the fact that, that my walk with God is not an own space, it's a rented space. Well, what do you mean by that? It's kind of like success. They, oftentimes they use that term in referencing success, that success is not rented, it's not owned, excuse me, but it's rented. Meaning this, when you buy something, that's it. It's already established. But when you rent something, you got to keep paying and you got to keep paying. And you're my walk with Jesus as a walk, not that we continue to keep paying, but we have to continue to keep serving him with the same fire, the same vigor, because don't think that a miracle or answer prayer is going to get you to serve God more. And I've discovered even in growing up in this ministry, some people who have experienced the greatest miracles. I mean, we've seen people people who've experienced their lives restored physically. We've seen people being set free from drug addiction, from alcoholism. We've seen people get healed of cancer and, and, and all types of sicknesses and disease. And you know what I noticed? That didn't turn them into a disciple. See, just because you're touched by God doesn't mean you're changed by God. Because to be changed by God requires an intentional commitment to the relationship with God. This is why I'm so adamant and a stickler as a believer that church is not just a place to feel good. Church is a place to come to learn, to grow, to increase in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So many will say, well, church is just a hospital for broken people. I disagree with that terminology. And the reason why I disagree with that is because if you view church as a hospital, then you only go when you're in a place that need enough care. And that's what's happened in this generation. We just view the church as a, a get-out-of-jail-free uh, card as opposed to a place that God wants to nurture you and build you up and to develop you. So when we talk about the concept of, uh, of drifting, it's centered in Hosea 4, verse number 7. The more they increase it, the more they went astray. And I think it's safe to say even in some of our lives personally that God has done some great things and God has delivered us and restored us, but where is our fire and our intensity in following after him? 
See, something happens when a need gets met. Something happens after a desire gets fulfilled. It sometimes dwindles the fire in us. It sometimes dwindles the motivation and the, and the tenacity to press into God because there's no longer a need at the front door. There's something that happens on the inside of us when we get into a place of luxury, when we get into a place of peace and everything is just fine and everything is normal. But I pray in this series of teaching that if you're in a position in your walk with Christ where you have drifted from God, that God is throwing you a life raft to get back on course. Or you may be here and say, my walk with God is tight. We're, we're, we're better than we've ever been. Well, friend, I encourage you to put these life rafts on your boat because you're going to hit a place and you're going to hit a wall and you're going to hit seasons of your life that if you're not anchored properly and if you're not rooted properly, you and I are all susceptible of drifting. We've been talking about the concept, once again, of drifting and by way of definition to drift means to be carried slowly by a current of air or water. We gave the definition that we created for this series of drifting to be entitled an unintentional pulling away from a desired space. All of us are susceptible to drifting. It doesn't matter if you're on the front row or the back row. It doesn't matter if you have a collar on today or a t-shirt and jeans. We're all susceptible to drifting. Jesus says something profound in John chapter 8, verse number 31. It says, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples. I think that he knew something that we didn't know. He knew that people would start with a fire but wouldn't continue in it. I think Jesus knew that people would get a glimpse of the glory of God and an experience, of experience the power of God, but it not become a part of their DNA and nature as a person. See, so many have started with God, but they're not continuing with God. And once again, growing up in the ministry, you, you, you could see it so vividly that so many would start, but not many continue with God. And I say this because you can never get so close to God where you think that there's not a need to press into God. You never get to a place where you get so familiar with him that you don't need to honor him and to reverence him and to protect that space of your relationship with him. Friend, the moment you think peace and safety, you are set to start drifting faster than you have ever seen before. Because if you ever think you arrive at the place where I'm, I'm comfortable and I'm content and I don't necessarily need God like I used to and I can back up in areas of my life, friend, the devil has got your mind. He has planted seeds of dissension, seeds of division that are going to cause you and I to begin to drift. Just to briefly recap, we've talked about four rafts so far. Today we're going to throw out the fifth life raft. The first raft that we threw out was the need to guard my heart. That if I don't guard my heart, then I'm going to drift. Everything begins in the heart. Things don't shift suddenly. They shift gradually too suddenly. See, things that are brewing, if you look at a relationship, they don't typically end overnight. It was a gradual that turned into a suddenly. And that all starts in the heart. Number two, we talked about the wrath of drawing the line, that if I don't have lines in my life, that I'm not crossing that line. I don't care what culture is doing. I don't care what family is doing. I don't care what my ethnic race is doing. I don't care what people that I love are doing. I'm not, drawing the, I'm not crossing the line. If you don't have lines in your life, friend, you will drift. Number three, we talked about charging our faith. Many times we drift because desires are unfulfilled. We lose hope. We lose expectation for God to do something phenomenal in our lives. We start to speak words of doubt, words of unbelief. Even sometimes I listen to individuals when they get older in age, and they start to think that because they're older that God is not going to do anything in their life anymore. And, and maybe God just wants to use them to train the next generation. Friend, as long as there's still life in your body, God still has destiny. God still has purpose. I, I believe it was Abraham was, what, 90 years old when he got started in his assignment. And Colonel Sanders was in his late 70s when he got started in making finger-licking chicken good. So I want you to be encouraged. I don't care how old you are. There's breath in your body so God still has destiny. He still has an assignment for you to fulfill. Don't you start talking that death talk. Don't you start talking that, well, he's finished with me and, and I'm just going to help these kids out. No, God still wants to do something in you. He still wants to do something through you. How do I know it? Because there's still life in your body. Amen. We talked about number four last week, raft number four. We have to drop our anchors. That if I'm not rooted in things in my life, then the currents will pull me if I don't have my anchors dropped. And that leads us to wrap number five today. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Discerning distractions. If I don't learn how to discern distractions, 
friend, I'm set up to begin to drift. In the early 1900s, a British pediatrician named George Frederick Steele discovered a disorder called ADHD, which is attention deficit hyperactivity neurodevelopment disorder. ADHD is marked by an ongoing pattern of inattention and or hyperactivity, imp hyperactive impulsive activity. It interferes with one's functioning or development. He referenced that people with ADHD experience an ongoing pattern of the following symptoms. They have an, an inability to maintain attention, which means a person has difficulty holding his or one's thought patterns. They experience hyperactivity, which means a person seems to move about constantly, never settled, never locked in on anything, always tossed to and fro, moved about constantly. There's an impulsivity, which means a person may act without thinking and have difficulty to practice self-control. You know, as I begin to study, up, study the effects of ADHD and the signs of ADHD, you know, when you look at the symptoms, it almost seems like everybody has ADHD if you start to read the symptoms. So it's not a surprise that through science they just want to uh, dope up a lot of kids today and say, well, they just need to be on medicine. And I, I, I'm not here to, I'm not a physician, but I think you should consult the physician on that. But nevertheless, when you look at this ADHD, what I discovered is that many of us have this in our walk with the Lord. We have attention deficit disorders. And so many times we drift because we can't hold our attention on Christ or hold our attention on our assignment. We can't hold our attention on what God has called us to do or hold our attention on what matters most. This is why every year you start the year with hope and expectation that this is my year, something's going to change, and you start to set the framework for your year to be a prosperous year. And by the time you get to the middle of the year in the summer months, you realize I haven't accomplished anything that was on my to-do list. And part of the reason about being is because many struggle to just hold the attention. What happens with distractions is that distractions take your thoughts and your energy the word distract means to draw apart through confusion. See, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, the Bible says, don't be ignorant of Satan's devices. Satan is clever. And Satan uses many times distractions to keep us off of what matters most. He, keeps, he provides distractions to keep you centered. So there's a reason why warfare starts to begin when you put your hands to certain things. When it seems like when I start to just put money away to buy the house, things start breaking down. I wonder why. It seems like when I try to invest in certain people, things just fall apart. I wonder why. It seems like when I start to just, even, even if you go on a fast and you want to go deeper in your walk with God, now when you show up to the office, they're giving away free cake and they're giving away free pies. And they've never done this before in life. But the moment you start a fast, and we're going to start a fast in January, but we're going to be ready for those distractions that are going to come. But it, there's a reason why it's always something pops up when I set my mind to do right, when I set my heart to go beyond where I am. When I get serious about the business, now the water tank is breaking down. And now, now my time is getting pulled because auntie is sick and, and I can't invest in writing a book. There's a reason why you get distracted because the enemy knows that if he can distract you, he can pull you away from what you should be doing. He can pull you away from what will really be a game changer in your life. And as you prepare to go into another year, I'm telling you by the Spirit of God, God has given you a game changing plan. God has given you a game changing gift. God has given you a game changing remedy. But those distractions keep taking you you out because Satan is clever. We're not going to give him more credit than he deserves because we understand he's a defeated foe. But even though he is already defeated, he's clever in how he moves. The Bible illustrates him as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. When you look at a lion, the way a lion hunts, he doesn't just come out of the wild and rawr. That's not how he hunts. 
but he's strategic. He'll circle his prey. He'll, he'll lie in the, in the tall grass, and he'll wait for hours for that right moment, and, and he'll steadily just creep up, and that's how the enemy works. And when he creeps up, many times he creeps through distractions. It's progressive. It's slowly, to, to, with the assignment, watch this, to pull me away through confusion. Because now I know I have something to do, but here's something else that's pulling me, so I'm confused, not knowing which direction to go in. I'm torn. Many of you are experiencing this right now under the sound of my voice. You know what you should be doing. You know where you should be, but there's something that's pulling you in another direction, and because it's pulling you, I'm in a state of confusion. This is how he works. And for some of us, we catch the bait every time. He throws out the distraction every time. We were talking about this in Young Adult Merge. We talked about how really it's almost like a video game. You know what I mean? And, and the way you beat a board is you keep failing at the same spot. Or how you lose on a board, you keep failing at the same spot. But you keep playing. The trap is the same every time you play the game. You know where the pitfall is. You know where the, 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 uh, the, 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 the chamber to get caught in. You know where the hole is. And for some of us, we keep playing the same game and we fall into the same hole time after time, year after year. But I believe by the Spirit of God that your eyes are being opened to see the wows or the strategy of the devil because he's strategic. It's like a magician. See, the way a magician works is he works through illusion. And then he's adamant about getting you to focus on an object so that you don't pay attention to how the trick is really worked. And so he'll say things like, look at my hand. You see what's in my hand? Nothing's in my hand. Because probably with his other hand, he's working something that he doesn't want you to see because what he's doing is he's manipulating the trick by keeping you locked on a certain position with your eyes. Distractions. I was watching a movie um, not long ago regarding the Holocaust. And many of the prisoners discovered that there were certain things that they would do that would attract the attention of the guards. And so they devised an escape plan, and in order to work their plan, they had to create distractions on the guards. So sometimes they would do things that they knew somebody might lose their life, but it's our only way to get out of here. And so they would stir up things in the camp just to get the soldiers to draw their attention on the issue. And while their attention is being drawn on the issue, there's a whole other team of guys who's doing some man manipulating and moving some things to help get them out of the camp. And I want to encourage you this morning is that many times the devil is bringing a distraction so that he can get you off focus of what God really has destined purpose for your life, but you're coming into a space where you're seeing the devices of the enemy through the form of distractions. You know, what's amazing about distractions is that distractions can be positive and distractions can be negative. See, sometimes distractions come through increase. I have been guilty of this distraction in running a business for rent, running businesses for years, and early on uh, in, 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 in marketing and, and running business in corporate America, what I've discovered is how addictive success can become. It can become super addictive. This is why as we build this series on the kingdom in the marketplace, we're dealing with foxes first. We're dealing with drifting first because we don't want to get into the nuts and bolts of God increasing us if we're not rooted where we should be. And I discovered that money and success is powerful. And many times that it would pull me, it would pull me out of where I should be spiritually, but I became a, began to become a producer naturally. This is how some of us are right now under the sound of my voice. You're producing naturally, but the natural production has forfeited your spiritual advancement. Distraction. See, sometimes distractions come in, in ways of, well, I'm just helping people. See, even I think it was in the book of Luke where Martha was busy. The Bible says she was distracted helping. I've learned as a pastor that even with your time, you, you, you can't put out every fire. You can't help every person. And sometimes some of you, you get caught up in doing all this good, but the good has put you further behind than what you should have been doing. See, distractions can come in positive things. I'm just taking care of the grandkids. 
It's kind of the season some of you are in in life where now all your time goes to the grandkid, but you don't have time to do what God's called you to do. It's a good thing because the grandchild needs somewhere to go. I'm distracted. Distractions can also be negative. Sometimes there are negative distractions that we experience in life that have the strength and the power to pull us. The distraction of a loss of a loved one. A distraction of a failed relationship. A distraction of a loss in a career. And so now as I manage through this grief, what should have only been a moment has now turned into a season. Because I couldn't manage the loss in its time. And so now my mourning has turned into my identity. And I'm so enamored and caught up in my loss that I can't see what God has for me in the day because I'm not seeing this day as my daily bread. I'm looking at what was lost in my past. And there are sometimes we can get so caught up in grief that I feel like if I let go of my past that I'm letting go of who I lost, not understanding who you lost has not really been lost, but a gain in heaven's eyes. But through this gain, I have to view it through the lenses of God to see that it now has become a distraction from what God has destined for my life. The power of every distraction is predicated by what lies in you. Because every distraction is connected to an attraction. So the question becomes, not why is this distraction coming? The question now becomes, what is the attraction in me that keeps yielding to it? See, if you start to look at your life, there are some things that trip you up every single time. You can illustrate for some, it could be relationships. As a pastor, you're a pastor, so you can relate. You get a, a panoramic view. And I've noticed relationships to be one of those tools that has the power to pull. Typically, relationships and money. Those are the two strongest things that I notice that pull people. And for some, it just keeps pulling us. Person after person, relationship after relationship, job after job, because unless something shifts in the attraction that's in me, I will fall for the distraction every time. And see, proximity to Jesus doesn't necessarily change the power of the attraction. Okay, I'm going to show you this. Go to Matthew chapter 14. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I feel like we've kind of hit a cruising altitude right now. Matthew 14, let me, uh, well, and let's, look at four, let's look at verse 22 through around 31. Very familiar passage of Scripture of Jesus walking on the water. When I was about six years old, I tried to walk on the water every time I went to the swimming pool and it never worked. I mean, that was the first thing. I, I just waited to see if the water would sustain me. Then I sunk every single time. Maybe I had to build my faith up. I don't know. I'm still waiting for that miracle to come into manifestation. But Matthew chapter 14, verse number 22, the Bible reads this. It says, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. While he sent the multitudes away, verse number 23, Good thing we have a backup. Matthew chapter 14, verse number 22. And we'll look at verse number and 23. It says, and when he sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by him. He went on to the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there, verse number 24. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea. Now, who was in the boat? The disciples. Okay, let's keep this in mind. Was in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. So what's happening right now? The wind is blowing. It's a storm. Okay, let's keep going. 
verse number and 25. Now the fourth watch of the night, fourth watch would be between 3 and 6 a.m. Now the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea, verse number and 26. Hold on, stop right there. I don't know how I would process that if I was if I was them. You out in the middle of the boat, in the water, and you see a figure come walking to you. See, sometimes we read the Scripture and we look down upon people in the Bible. And some of us is grown, still running up the steps at night thinking we heard something. Locking every door in the house. Okay, okay, let's keep going. Now, the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. Verse number 26. Let's keep going. Verse number 26. It says, and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. Verse number 27. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, be of good cheer. It is, it, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. Verse 28. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you. Command me to come to you on the water, verse number 29. And he said, come. And when Peter had come out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Okay, stop here. Jesus sends his disciples in a boat to go cross over. They're at night. It's at nighttime. And while a storm is happening, Jesus decides to take the expressway to get to the other side. Man, Jesus was cold, man. I don't know about you, but I can't wait to see Jesus, man. I, I just need five minutes of his time. I just want to talk to you for a minute, man. He, he, see, sometimes people propose Jesus as this weak dude who, you know what I mean, who was just this, this little lamb and me. Man, Jesus was a bad boy, man. I'm telling you. The wisdom that flowed through Jesus, the, the, the ability to discern and to see and perceive was just impeccable. And Jesus, and there had to be, if he's walking on water, there had to be a stroll to his walk, man. He, had, he just had to be flowing, boy. He, he was probably just on the waves, man. Just, he had to be strolling, man. Jesus wasn't no square, man. I'm telling you, man. That's just my perspective. You ain't going to find it in Scripture. But he said, and Jesus, so, so he sees Jesus walking. Now, let's keep this in our mind. There's a storm happening. Keep that in the base. Jesus comes and walks on the water. Peter sees him and says, can I join you? Can I come to you? Jesus says, yes. Okay, keep this in your mind. There's a storm. Peter is in the storm. Peter sees the storm. Peter is experiencing the storm, but in the storm, he sees Jesus. Okay. Some of you, in your storm, you saw Jesus. Okay, let's keep going. Verse number 30. But when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out saying, Lord, save me. Here's what doesn't make sense. The weather was boisterous when he started. See, so, so, in your life, the storm was boisterous when you started. But there was some type of encounter you had where you saw Jesus. But something happened where Jesus' attention was no longer enough. See, I can see if the scripture would have said, while he was walking on water and came to Jesus, the winds picked up. The winds were there from the beginning. So he hit a place. Watch this. I see through my storm to Jesus. But for whatever reason now, the storm is still here, but the storm is now more prevalent than Jesus. Jesus. 
meaning Jesus' attention, it started out being enough. But after a while, it was no longer enough. See, I, I'm, I'm hoping you start to see you in this situation. Because there have been many a times in our lives where I'm in a battle or a storm and I run to the altar or the feet of Jesus because he's enough. But for whatever reason, the distraction now is so great that he's not enough. Because as long as he would have kept his eyes on Jesus, he never would have sank. And as long as you would have kept, oh, you don't hear me this morning. As long as you would have kept your eyes on Jesus, you never would have sank. Now, sinking does not mean the storm stopped. See, process what I'm saying. It's not about the storm stopping. It's about where your eyes are in the storm. Because if I fix my eyes on something fixed in the storm, it has the ability to settle out and bring me into a place of being, what would they call your equilibrium being, being balanced. I remember a few years ago, I was off the Indian Ocean in South Africa, and I went shark cage diving. And I'm thinking, I'm getting ready to go on a huge charter boat. That was where my mindset was. And I pull up to, uh, we pull up to, to the place that we were scheduled to be, and, you know, I'm looking around, where's the, I'm looking for a dock. You understand what I'm saying? Because in my mind, I'm getting on a charter boat. And all I see is a little dinghy. Tied to a rope. And I'm kind of scratching my head like, okay, this, this can't be it. Like, you know, we're, we're, you got me. Where's the boat? You know, this is kind of where my mind was. And like, no, th th this is it. Little 12-foot dinghy. And if you've ever been to the Indian Ocean, the Indian Ocean has massive waves. You know, you go down to Florida or you go to, to uh, uh, California, if there's a, a storm, you know what I'm saying, you might get a little high. But you go to the Indian Ocean, I mean, those waves roar. So in my mind, I can't even fathom how we even going to get out into the water in this little dinghy, all right? And so we go and we put our wetsuits on and, and we get ready and, and we, we get into this little dinghy. And I'm like, oh, Lord, I don't, well, I don't know what I signed up for, but if I go out, I'm going out in the bang today. I know that. And so we get out there in the water, and the water was so choppy. I mean, it's up and down and in and out, up and down, up and down. And, and, and they throw out this chum, uh, you know, this blood mixture stuff. And, and in a matter of minutes, sharks just come swarming the boat. I'm like, whoa, this is amazing. And guess who they made jump in the water first? Out of six people, they delegate me to go first. So I couldn't punk out. You know what I'm saying? So I had to just, all right, had to jump out there. And I get in the water, and, man, our fear is running all through my body. I'm not going to lie, but I've kind of been in this space of pushing myself to do things I wouldn't normally do. All right, you got to overcome the spirit of fear. And so, so I'm out there, and I'm watching these boats, and now Pastor Jerome jumps in the cage with me. And he thinks we're at SeaWorld with trained animals. Because he puts his hands out to try to pet the sharks. What are you thinking? Do you not watch Shark Week? And so here we are face to face with these sharks. And I mean, it was an amazing encounter to be face to face in their live habitat in the underworld. And it's just an incredible experience. But now that I'm on the boat, I'm starting to get seasick. But guess what? We got five more people who paid for an experience who got to get down in the water. And I'm like, get me out of here. And the, you know, the captain said something profound to me. He said, look at the shore. Because when you're in a place where your equilibrium is up and down, 
All you have to do is set your eyes on something fixed. You might be in the middle of your storm right now. And you may have been in a place where you were able, at one point in time, I can see through the storm to see Jesus. But now I'm in a place now where I'm in super close proximity to Jesus, but now he's not enough. you got to set your eyes back on something fixed to pull you up out. The distraction Poor Peter. But I want to give you some insight over the next few minutes. Our time is winding down about how to reset your eyes. Go in, our, go in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. Let's go to verse number 1 and 2, Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2, where we find where Apostle Paul talks about the race of faith. And he says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily ensnares us. Okay, let's stop right here. He's talking about how do we run this race? How do I deal with? For, for sake of teaching in this series, how do I deal with these distractions in the race that I'm running in? Because all of us are pulled with, the, with distractions because they're connected to our attractions. He says, therefore, let us, watch this, lay aside every weight. Let us lay aside every weight. Let us lay aside every weight. What that illustrates is that nobody else can lay aside my weight but me. Your pastor can't lay aside your weight. Your praying grandmother can't lay aside your weight. Your aunties and them can't lay aside your weight. Your bishop can't lay aside your weight. You have to make a decision. Am I going to lay aside every weight? But what is every weight? That word weight means mass, also meaning burden. What seems so heavy in your life? What mountain just seems so huge that I don't even know how I can overcome it? Got to lay it aside. But then it goes on to say not every, not just every weight, but then it also says, and the sin. Let us lay aside every weight. Let us lay aside every sin. Sin referencing disobedience where my mind is not consistent with God's mind. That's where sin enters in. My thoughts and his thoughts are not equal anymore. This is how we get engaged into sin because there's a breach in opinions. We come out of unity. We come out of oneness with God. So let us lay aside every way, which so easily, if you have the King James Version of the Bible, it says besets us, but in the New King James Bible, Version of the Bible, it says ensnares us. And what that word snare means, it means to be thwart. Thwart implying to be entangled or to be wrapped up without having ability to now move. This is where some of us are right now in life. I'm wrapped up in the burden. I'm wrapped up in the grief. I'm wrapped up in the hurt. I'm wrapped up in the disappointment. And not only am I wrapped up in the disappointment and the grief, now this has opened the door in the chamber of areas of sin in my life. And until I let it aside, I can't run the race. And I love what he says. He says, it so easily ensnares us. I'm fraught, meaning it's not even a challenge. It easily ensnares us. And let us run the race with endurance that is set before us. Verse number two, here's where we want to go. Looking unto Jesus. The author and finisher of our faith. Oh, this is powerful. What he's saying here, what Paul is writing, he's illustrating that in order to win the race, my eyes must be set on the prize. Every time you take your eyes off of Jesus, you are going down. If I could sing, I would break out like Mary J. Blige right now and start singing, I'm going down. I'm going down because you ain't around. And watch this. And my whole world's turned what? Upside down. Some of our whole worlds are now turned upside down. Because we took our eyes off of Jesus. Every pity party season I have ever had. You may not ever have them because I know you are professional Christians. I'm still growing in this thing. And there are times where I will have pity parties. 
and I send out invitations. You know what I'm talking about? We send an invitation where we, we connect with people we want the sympathy from. That's an invitation. And those pity parties can take you to a, such a desolate place. They are powerful. And I start thinking about all that I've given for the gospel. And I think about all that I sacrificed. And I start thinking about all that I give. And I start thinking about what I could have did and where I should have been and what I could have had, what I could have accomplished. And I laid it all down for the gospel. And I start to think about who hurt me. And I start to think about who betrayed me. And I start to think about who has done insurrection. And, and all it does is it takes me deeper. And I just start getting nestled into those thoughts. And you know what I realize? Is that it can only take me as deep as my eyes go. Because I'm beginning to magnify my circumstance above God. You don't need me to lay hands on you. You just got to set your eyes back on the author and the finisher of your faith. Well, it's that simple? Yes. Well, I didn't feel anything. You don't have to feel anything. Well, well, well we, didn't, we didn't run. You don't have to run. Well, I didn't feel the fire of the Holy Ghost, and they didn't play my favorite song, and I didn't weep at the altar. You ain't got to do all that. There is nothing wrong with that, but that is not affirmation to the hand of God moving in your life. We're not to be moved by what we see. We're moved by faith. This is why he instructs us to walk by faith, not by sight. And you know what I had to do? I got to set my eyes back on him. I got to set my eyes. I got to bring my, Josh, you wilding out right now? This is how I talk to myself. Josh, you own one. You tripping? You need to get your mind back where it needs to be. You got to focus your mind back on Jesus. Because if you go, go back to that verse. Let's keep that verse up for the remainder of the service. But it says this, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our, author and finisher of our faith. There is no faith that's planted in your heart that he does not authorize. So not only does he authorize it, but he says, I'm the finisher of what I authorize. Who watched this? For the joy that was set before him endured the cross and despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. When you are battling with distractions, you got to set your eyes back on the author and the finisher of your faith and allow your mind to get centered in him being the joy that is set before you that will enable you to endure whatever you're journeying through right now is found in your eyes getting fixed back on Jesus. I just set your eyes. And it says, watch this, the joy was set before you. What was the joy that was set before him? The joy that was set before him was you. The joy that was set before him was me. So even though he knew the cross was his final destination, he says, if I don't go to the cross, Ray can't get out. And if I don't go to the cross, Ron can't be free. And if I don't go to the cross, Vince can't get free of the addiction. And if I don't go to the cross, then your joy can't be restored. So he said, no matter what I'm dealing with right now, I can see through the distraction to keep my eyes fixed on the author and the finisher because he had a joy that was set before him to endure the cross. And I'm telling you this morning, by the Spirit of God, if you set your mind back, set your heart back, set your eyes back, there's no mountain in your life you can't endure. There's no valley in your life that you can't endure. There is no test. There is no trial. There is no temptation that is knocking on your life door right now that you can't endure if you choose to set your eyes back on Jesus. And then he goes on to say, despising the shame. See, because it was shameful for him being the king of kings, 
and the Lord of Lords to walk through a town stripped naked. And it was shameful for his body to be broken. And it was shameful for him to be nailed to the cross. But he despised the shame. And this is why he said, I can pray for a legion of angels right now to come and deliver me. But we're going to walk through this valley together because I'm going to despise the shame that I'm experiencing in this divine moment. And right where you are right now, there might be shame in the valley that you're in. And there might be shame in the battle that you're going through. But you got to despise the shame. Well, how do I despise the shame? Keep my eyes looking unto Jesus. Restore your sight and you'll come back alive. Restore your sight and your hope will come back. Restore your sight and your faith will come back. Restore your sight. This is why Elisha prayed, God, open their eyes that they may see. And I pray by the Spirit of God that he is opening your eyes to see this morning that there is more with you. There is more for you. There is more next to you than what's standing against you. You just got to fix your eyes again on the author and the finisher of your faith. Fix your eyes. I wish we had time, but Proverbs chapter 4, verse 25 through 27 gives you insight on how to walk in a place of not being moved by distractions. Friend, I believe you're coming into your greatest season. I believe you're coming into your greatest hour. I believe that you're coming into a season of divine manifestation. But in order for that to happen, you got to set your eyes back. You got to set your perspective back. You got to get an aerial view. See, when you get the eyes of Christ and He gives you an aerial view, you start seeing it from a different situation. See, there are some prayers that you've been believing God to answer that he's already answered, you just can't see it because you're seeing it from a limited point of view. See, there's a thing, you're praying about God restoring a relationship with somebody, and he ain't restoring it because God sees the end from the beginning, but you're locked in on what you want. But the moment you set your eyes on Jesus, you get elevated to a place to start seeing aerial view. And when you got an aerial view, you can see things that you couldn't see when you were on a horizontal playing field. And God wants to raise your eyes to start to see again like his eyes see. And when you start to see like him, you'll start to feel like him. And you'll start to be touched by the feelings of people's infirmities just like he's touched. Because I see a bigger picture. I'm not responding to the anguish of the attitude. I see the brokenness of heart that's really dealing with abandonment. And instead of going toe-to-toe with you, and instead of responding to the negativity and the energy that you bring, I'm going to go superior level over your energy. I love what Michelle Obama said. When they go low, sometimes you just got to go high. And you got to go high getting God's views. And you got to go high getting God's eyes. Because you can't go where you don't see. And today you're here by the Spirit of God because God is being an optometrist in your life today. God is correcting your vision. God is bringing your eyes back to a place that sees him as who he is. For somebody today, God is restoring your eyes. You've been wearing these glasses and still bumping into stuff, but God is taking those glasses off this morning, and he's restoring your eyesight to where it needs to be because when you see right you can do right and when you see right you can live right and when you see right you can perceive right and when you see right you can do right but it all is connected to how you see this is why the scripture says take heed what you see all over this auditorium let's just lift our hands And I pray now by the Spirit of God that wherever your vision has gotten off, maybe it's blurry, maybe I'm, Pastor, I'm keeping my eyes sight, but it's just blurry right now. Or maybe you're like Peter and you took it completely off of Jesus. And that shift in your eyes sight is causing you to drift. But there's a life raft that God is throwing out in the spirit this morning. And he's saying, son or daughter, we got to correct your eyes. Son and daughter, you got to see right. And allow the spirit of God to take you into chambers to see how he sees, to feel how he feels. And Lord, I thank you that by the power of the Holy Ghost, 
Lord, that you are liberating us from distractions. Lord, give us eyes to see that when the distraction comes, Lord, that we can discern it and we can be sensitive to see it before it gets to us. Lord, we're not falling for those same traps year after year. We're not falling for those same hurdles year after year that keep tripping us up. But God, you're anointing our eyes to see today. And we thank you, Lord God. As Elisha prayed, open their eyes. We ask that you open our eyes today. Lord, help us to see. Help us to see in our homes what our children are really dealing with that's being expressed with negative behavior. Give us eyes to see what's causing the behavior. Lord, give us eyes to see what's causing the tension in our marriage. See, you need the eyes to see it. And the anointing of God, the Spirit of God, is ministering to your eyesight right now. He's ministering to your eyesight. He's ministering. I sense the Spirit of God even in this moment doing some corrective surgery. Mm -hmm. There's some, for some of you, there's some words that you've been listening to. There's some opinions of others that you've been listening to that has shifted your views. And it shifted your priorities. God is healing that today. He's restoring for somebody and he's restoring your fire again. Just take a moment. It's between you and God. See, there's some things you just ain't seeing it right. Some of we've, we've cultivated tunnel vision. See, Peter started by seeing through the storm. But over time, the storm became greater than Jesus. Allow the Spirit of God to heal that. See, the spirit world is an opening of an eye away. And there's some of you, even in the arena of business, you need to see into the next dimension. That's why you're struggling going from red to the black. This is something you're not seeing. But the spirit of God will anoint your eyes to see. And when your eyes become to see, anointed to see in this dimension, you will be ahead of time in time. Mm, thank you, Holy Spirit. Set our eyes. Set our eyes as a church, Father. not about a building. Set our eyes on you, Jesus. And as you set our eyes, I pray that you set our minds. Over this next few weeks, God is going to set your eyes. And as he sets your eyes, I will challenge and charge you. As Joshua was charged when they prepared to go into the land of Canaan, 
Don't look to the left or to the right. Because where you look, where you go. Just let the Holy Ghost talk to you for a minute. This is the cool of the day moment we're having right now. So God will come talk to Adam in the cool of the day. This is a cool of the day moment right now. Speak, Father. Your servant listens. Thank you, Deborah. 